On this one, it's going to be a little long. I'm assuming it's going to be broken up into a bunch of pieces. But on this one, I'm going to be talking about myself since I'm assuming a lot of people are curious how I am, how I got to where I am, some of my life experiences. And I'll be discussing like, um, like a lot of <laughs> messed up stuff. But as an example, to let people know that, that you're not alone. A lot of people go through a lot of horrible things in their life and you don't have to carry all that within you and you can f I guess release everything and forgive for yourself I mean just basically anything and I'll go through a lot of the stuff and I'll be double divulging a lot of stuff and then my uh, different events in relation to my different moments of walk-ins and I know I say, I'm going to be saying a lot of crazy stuff, or I've said a lot of crazy stuff, and I've thought about that. Like, what if, what if, like, I did have split personalities, or I was insane, or just making all of this up? And I thought about it. With all this, it did change my life. It changed my perspective. It made me a better person. And everything that, like, they've taught me, if it could be wrong, I, I choose to believe in it because it just makes everything better. And, and with the information I give to other people, it does improve their life. It actually causes no harm. So in that, I rather choose to believe in that than a lot of stuff that's out there currently in society that has made people miserable. So I know some of the, a lot of the stuff I say is crazy, but it doesn't hurt you. It actually just improves everything and it's just a matter of perspective and I'm here not to tell people what to do just to be an example of after I explain everything I've went through that everything doesn't have to stay shitty that it gets better it can be better you can make it better within your mind within your heart within your spirit without even everything even in your environment being shitty but within yourself and then when you keep carrying that nothing stays everything changes so all the all the negative stuff around you it, eventually it goes away and then you carry that energy carry that positive energy you carry that love then that's what all will manifest but you have to realize that energy that negative energy you had carried for a long time you have to deprogram that within yourself within your frequency so it does take some time it's a lot of it is not going to be instant and so you just know that within yourself and you do slowly gradually start changing your your environment you start manifesting what you feel inside like i said that's what the universe sees and knows and what, when you feel it inside that's what the universe presents to you um and also i guess i'll go through my different my list of like everything is tons of stuff uh moments where i could have died um, at birth, my mom had a, a really traumatic um, birth with me that I got stuck and she almost died and I'm assuming I almost died and it did mess up like one of my, my right hip, like my leg is like, uh, I forgot how many, like a centimeter shorter and I could tell and I didn't know that till like late when I got older. I could tell like when I ride bikes and stuff like something was off. Yeah. And um when I was about like three or four years old, my parents and I were going on a camping trip and it was up in the mountains and my dad fell asleep driving. Um, and it was crazy. The only person that wasn't hurt was my brother. But uh, my parents ended up staying in ICU for two weeks. Uh, my right leg was messed up and it had to stay bandaged for a while. But my parents were in the ICU for two weeks and my mom was almost decapitated. And the only can get this, the only thing that saved her was her afro that her head through the windshield and the only thing that kept her from getting decapitated was her afro, which is crazy. So on that one, um, and then I've, I've had a really messed up life, like a seriously messed up life. And at 12 years old, I tried to commit suicide. I swallowed all the pills that were in my house and my dad had gotten in trouble numerous times for child abuse, even went to jail. My brother was in, fo in a foster home for a little while. 
And um, I remember, like I was sick for two weeks and my dad didn't want to take me to the hospital because he didn't want to get in trouble because it was a big old event why I ended up trying to commit suicide, but he was involved in it. So he didn't want to go to jail, didn't take me to the hospital. I just stayed at home. And the crazy part was evidence of this. Uh, there was a whole bunch of capsules that I had swallowed and I had been throwing up and throwing up. And then it was even two days later, I was still throwing up capsules, which is impossible. So somehow, some way, they were preventing me from actually physically dying. <clears throat> that was what my third incident. Um, let me see. And there was one where I was pregnant with my son, and my daughter was like two years old, three years old, and the my baby daddy at the time we were watching we were all he partied a lot at his house like everybody was partying and he lived like right across the street from the high school so people would ditch school and it was it was a little bit like around eight or nine o'clock at night it was dark and my daughter was playing with the ball and they, this was not a busy street at all it wasn't a busy street especially that time at night and my daughter was playing with the ball and i was on the edge of the street my daughter was playing with the ball and it went into the street and no joke i didn't know what it was but my guides at that time told me to get her so i went to go get her and i was eight nine months pregnant and they said no run so i ran to get her and no shit this kid was trying to show off with his sports car hauled ass down the street and if i wouldn't have ran well if i wouldn't have gotten my daughter she would have died if I wouldn't have ran, me, my daughter, and my son would have died. So that could have been another timeline jump or um, a walk-in. <clears throat> and, and there was another, another camping trip, probably like s uh, several years ago where a t my tire blew and it was pretty bad and it scared the bejesus out of me. It was really, really bad. And the only thing, like, I didn't know at the time, my guide screamed at me to start pumping the brakes, which I didn't know to do that. Instead of just doing a full slide into a, it almost felt, the car almost fell into a ditch. And my guides prevented me and my kids from dying on that incident. <clears throat> um, let me see. And I think, I can't even remember. And they said there's another way to, like all of us in some way, like for years and years until recently, like the last couple of years, I was suicidal. Not like outwardly, like trying to kill, kill myself or cut myself. Or, it was more like where I didn't really care about myself. So I did have a stint where I was an alcoholic. And on purpose, I wouldn't put on my seatbelt. I would not eat. Well, I would just eat all kinds of junk. And that's a form of being suicide. suicidal, is just not caring and not doing the right thing for yourself. Where you're hoping to die, so you do everything not to take care of yourself. And if God takes you, God takes you. And that's another version of being suicidal that people need to be aware of. Just being alive but not living life and yeah and I really hated myself for like the way I was treated throughout my life since I was Korean and black my parents loved my brother even though I was a firstborn child but it was a traditional thing where like they honored the males the females I was brought up to be like you just, you, you're you pretty and you're smart, but you shut your mouth. You don't embarrass the family. You show honor and respect because it was a military family too. And you don't cry. Um, you don't show weakness. You don't ask for help. You don't lie. You don't cheat. But then it turned out everybody around me, <laughs> I learned later, everybody around me was pretty much lying and cheating, except me. 
but then I thought I was I was the one that was screwed up and because I was so different from everybody I really hated myself I just thought like what's wrong with me that everybody else is enjoying life and I'm always the target of being used and I even labeled myself as the fixer even as a little kid Even as a little kid, like this was before I was even in school, I was really, really smart and my parents took advantage of that. I was super, super smart before I was even in school, probably around the age of four. Um, I remember my dad was teaching me my ABCs and my numbers, but I had an issue with the letter S and the number five that I kept doing it wrong and my dad was very abusive where literally he would beat the shit out of you and with the belt. And I remember my mom was there and I was looking at her and I was crying. And I remember this in the details, like three or four. And he kept beating me and I wanted my mom to help me and she didn't. But as a child in my head, I was like, I thought my mom was a bitch because she didn't help me. But now as adult, being older, I realized that she was just as afraid as I was because my dad was always beating her. He was an alcoholic. So whenever he felt like we were always walking on eggshells. So he was always beating all of us. And this is the ugly part. And I remember this into detail. And I think as a, I mean, what I did was shitty, but as the end result, I think in some way spiritually it saved me. Um, one day when my dad went to work, we lived in military housing. I think I was like three, three or the most for um, I, after that event I was so mad at my mom my mom went outside to go do something or I think I even lured her outside how shitty I am it was fucking cold she didn't have a jacket or anything I locked her out of the house for hours as revenge for letting my I thought like she let she didn't help me that she only cared about herself I remember having these thoughts and I wanted revenge and I locked her out all day in the cold and she was crying out there and I remember actually enjoying it and then my dad finally came home and he beat the bejesus out, like beat me. And I know that, I don't know what it was in me, that aspect of me or whatever, like it like backed off, that darkness backed off and it just stayed in the background. And then now that part, I know, like I've worked with that part and that part doesn't cause harm we've all, all agreed on it it doesn't cause harm but whenever like i'm threatened that part comes out to defend me like you can actually see when i start explaining there'll be another video where i'll teach you how to recognize your aspects by recognizing my aspects and especially when i start streaming you'll see them and then you'll see that it's easy to recognize your aspects and work with them that they're always coming out you just don't notice but yeah doing that even though it was horrible and then my dad beating the bejesus out of me like i think it saved me from having like a dark life like that aspect would have just stayed i would have just been totally hateful and destructive um and let me see oh um when i learned about when i learned about um walk-ins i asked them well, actually it turned out a couple years ago when I started learning more about what was going on and my guides were talking to me and giving me messages and showing me stuff. And I knew like I was a good person and what was going on in the world that there's a lot of us doing this processing stuff and changing the world just by existing and being positive and learning things that we, we spread it by frequency. We don't even have to say it out loud. And I was like, I still hated myself. I was still miserable. I was still sad. I was still running around thinking I needed to fix myself. And I still couldn't understand where like, people were always mean to me. And I felt like they were taking advantage of me, which wasn't true. I was just, I was letting them. When, if you think about it, if you keep handing and doing things for people, there's no one to actually blame but you because you're teaching them how to treat you. And I had to learn that. And that's part of being codependent and having that needy aspect and uh, looking for 
acknowledgement outside yourself. The only person you need to care about what thinks about of, of you is you. You're the most important being in your life. So you have to fight for yourself, believe in yourself. No one else can do it. And once you do that, it doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks because you know who you are. Well, I had asked them and I was like, I know I'm a good person. And I was like, and I know this, I know not all of this is karma. And I was like, can you please show me why I should love you, love myself? And that's another thing too. Your guides can, they can't like just randomly give you stuff. You already have to have part of the knowledge. That's why you need to learn stuff. But they also said like, when you ask them stuff, it's a matter of asking the right questions. And they said, that was one of the best questions I could have asked. And with that, they led me to INFJ, like the Myers-Briggs personality categories. And I, they, I didn't even look at anything. They just instantly showed me INFJ. I'll go into detail a little bit later how well they can communicate with you in numerous ways i don't want to make this one really really long but they led me to infj and that within itself like when they showed me that it made me cry and it explained why i was so different in the way i think and how like i know things and when i see people like i see red flags like i don't even try i just it i just know and that totally like i totally embraced the infj and when I would ever, whenever I mention I'm an INFJ, it's not to prove like I'm better. I started mentioning the INFJ because so many times, because the way I think and the way I see things, sometimes the way I talk, people get offended and they don't real like, I kind of got tired of like explaining myself because I never come from a point of thinking of myself as better than someone or trying to up someone or like the information I'm giving, it's always, I always come from a point of loving. I love everybody, but I know there's a difference from loving everyone and being in love with someone. But I love everybody and everything, even people who hurt me. And I always want to help everyone. And in my mind, like I know so much stuff, I've downloaded so much stuff, experienced so much stuff and connected so many dots. Like I would I love sharing anything that would spare anybody suffering and pain and time to discover all this. And that's why like I love telling people stuff, but sometimes people take it the wrong way, which that's not me. I always come from a loving aspect to help, not to overdo or updo someone. Never I I just don't and whenever I say anything, even if it comes out kind of in a harsh way, it's because I love you and like I'm totally frustrated, like I don't want you to suffer. And so that's when I would talk about the, I, that I am an INFJ so they can see like my perspective where I'm coming from, but not that I'm like better than anybody. And then they led me to Dol Dolores Cannon uh, with the walk-ins. Uh, and from what I understand, they gave me two numbers, seven and 11, but it's weird. I think it was split timelines. Like I think one timeline had, um, I don't know, I'll learn that later, what, what those numbers mean. Um, and that many of us that are here, we were picked for, we were picked with these to manifest in these families and these bloodlines. It has to do with the DNA. Many of us are actually shamans and it has to do with our heritage and the karma that was in the family, the trauma. Um, and some of our bloodlines deal with a lot of like magic that we are like super manifestors, that they just couldn't come into regular bodies and regular bloodlines. And then some of us were put in bloodlines that were very damaged, that had a lot of karma. And by placing like family bloodlines that can cause even more harm to other people. So they put us in these bloodlines to break the cycle. That that's, we're really good at doing that. So since we repair the karma, break the cycle, that then these families don't cause the damn like it changes time it changes the events of time that we affect e existence in numerous ways different layers that we can't even imagine just our existence is amazing um 
let me see. <clears throat> and one of the things they did for me, like the family that I'm in, like on both sides, there's a lot of messed up stuff. There's a lot of drug dealing, uh, gun selling, people not finishing school, having kids very early in life, child abuse, even incest. And incest is actually almost a common thing and people just don't talk about it or they don't, they try not to ignore it. Having that uncle that's everybody knows, don't leave your kids around or, you know, family members that are just too touchy feely or weird instances that just people just hide. And not realizing that stuff like that really damages a lot of people, a lot of people. And it just hurt people, hurt people. And so I was brought in this family to break that, what I would call a, a what we would call a family curse. And all it is, is basically um, someone carries that frequency. It's almost like a recording in the body of those events. And then what happens is, say like with the mother that has that frequency, those events, that thinking in her body, she hasn't resolved it. She gets pregnant and it's like a, a recording. That baby gets that recording and that child replays, has those events in their life. So I always tell people, resolve your stuff, work on your stuff, break those curses because you, in that way, think about frequency, it's simple. You transfer it to your child and then it just spreads and spreads and it becomes a family curse. Um, uh, then, um, because the family that I'm in was so messed up that a lot of the stuff, like it, my memories of my life, I don't remember that much. It's almost like an outline. And even like my kids will talk about stuff. I don't remember. I don't. And my guides had told me that it was a way to protect, like it was those memories were blocked or I don't know, maybe there's aspects almost like a split person there that are, that carry all the pain and keep it somewhere else. Because they, they said that in my frequency in this body, it was too intense for every walk-in that came in, it made them all suicidal. So they had to do something. So they blocked all that stuff and so basically I just have an outline of my life and that was one of the protection mechanisms that they put in for my walk-ins and I'm assuming they probably do it for other walk-ins like I was thinking I was like do I have dementia or Alzheimer's and they explained no it's a protection mechanism for all the walk-ins because the pain was too much and they slowly drip in as I know each walk-in that I don't know if they all stay in or one leaves or I don't I've heard different things but I know like each walk in that comes in, they each one has a higher frequency and it has to be done that way because too much of a higher frequency would be an imbalance and it would actually um, cause like a dying of the physical body and make it very sick. So it's like one walk in has a higher frequency and the next walk in is higher and higher and higher. Um, but they do let me in certain occasions, like there was one instance where my son was saying stuff and I was feeling really guilty about it and um, they let me remember. And it was, my son was being manipulated and not telling the whole story. And they let me remember, which, oh my God, when they did, it made me cry and I was so angry. And now I see why they block out a lot of, a lot of the memories, but yeah, they do, they do do that. And um, they were explaining to me I don't know if originally I was uh, one of the three of the team that showed up in the body, but what I guess with the first walk-in, the original soul had agreed to allow the walk-in, but the original soul, the agreement that the original soul wanted, they, she still cared for her family and she realized like all the trauma and the pain that it was being spread, you know, generationally, that she didn't want her family to suffer anymore. So the agreement was with the walk-ins, they had to agree to resolve the karma, 
to help the rest of the family members. And that was the only way she would allow the walk-ins to come in. And so I'm assuming some of you that are walk-ins, you probably gave, you know, designed that same agreement. So these walk-ins are very, very strong, very, very powerful. They can process a lot. They can deal with a lot. And so when they come in, of course, they don't have their previous memories. They have the memories of the body. That That's why some of the, your life has been hella fucking crazy because the walk, because the karma of your family bloodline is so fucked up. But these walk-ins agreed, agreed to go through all of this and work out all the karma. And that's why you have so many traumatizing events, so many like horrible people coming in your life to work out all this karma. So it's not like you're being punished, you're actually doing a service to the family bloodline and to the whole planet to uplift the uplift uplift the evolution of the whole planet yeah this video is going to be hella long because i haven't even made it past the first page oh my god um okay next i'm going to and this might involve a lot of people so along with another part of the karma that i'm dealing with is like i had this hatred for my mom my dad like my brother um previous people that are i was with total hatred and like my mom was really mean to me since i was a female and i was the oldest like they treat the females horrible um and i was mad at my mom for staying with my dad and letting him abuse us like serious abuse us which now I understand she was Korean um, and she was disowned by her family because she left the country and the fact that my father was black and she couldn't just up and take me and my brother back to Korea because she was a single mom. No one would have helped her. Um, we would have had to have been put up for adoption. So she decided she didn't know any English. So she decided to talk, take, you know, stay with my dad, do the best she could, which she was abused severely. Even when she was pregnant with me in Korea, my dad had beat her so bad, he broke her jaw. So they had, and they couldn't go to the military hospital because he would get arrested. So um, they sold her wedding ring um, to get her jaw fixed. And even then my dad was a severe drug addict too. And I think he was doing a lot of heroin. Like even they described one time, like he just wigged out and like on the electric stoves, like he had burnt both of his palms, like I guess to punish himself. But like I thought my dad hated me my whole life. Like he treated me horrible and treated my brother better. But I didn't, I didn't find out till after he died. After he died, I know this sounds shitty. Um, he had a lot of psychological. I'll wait on that one because it's pretty bad. Um, like my mom, that she had to, a couple of years ago, she had a stroke while gambling at the casino and she came home and she was slurring her speech and i thought it, and i was working a lot so i was always busy and i was like what's wrong with she was like she was saying it was her dentures but then it was like two days later i realized she had had a stroke because her speech still stayed that way but um there was nothing else she could they could have done for the stroke but i didn't know like what dementia when you actually have actual outward symptoms you've already had dementia for 15 years like it was already basically damaging the brain and my mom was already mean to me so i just thought she was just getting ornery and old no it was that and the dementia which made her like act super crazy and then again um was it two years ago she had a stroke and it was really bad it messed up one side and she had to have some surgery but they explained to me that what it was um, this last stroke or maybe it was the first one but they explained to me that she passed away what they described to me that the original soul had left 
and I don't know, maybe I interpreted it wrong. Maybe the original soul is still in there, but almost like asleep. Because there's certain moments, like her awareness is like she's totally normal. She's not mean. She's like the old, old mom that I remember. And she's talking and she's asking questions. And all of a sudden, it's like that portion goes to sleep again. And then she's this other thing that almost acts like a narcissist. Like chooses not to do anything and then acts like a baby wants you to do everything and then talks to you really mean and ugly and then even smirks about it when she does it and then she'll claim that she can't do something and if no one's looking she'll do it when no one's looking like weird stuff like that <clears throat> but yeah they were saying that um she was a walk-in and the reason why they did that or they allowed that to happen was so i could work out some karma for this body for that anger to resolve not to carry that anger so i can learn to like love her and appreciate her and understand her which that happened even though my mom acts crazy i still love her to death i still love her and i appreciate like everything like all the stuff that she's went through so all the stuff my guys taught me just like I can't hate anybody and I can see from like everything that everybody does I can see from their perspective but it doesn't mean I allow them to treat me like shit or I have to stay in that situation but I still love them and I, I wish the best for them and I hope that they can find love they can find resolution they can find happiness like I hate to see anybody suffer in any way and that's why part of the reason well why I'm here and why I'm doing this to let you know like you don't have to carry all the pain and things don't even have to change in your situation it's just a matter of perspective what's inside you and then once you start doing the the inner work and like the, bringing in all your aspects like I say like that light lights up inside you and it's like it's just crazy to feel that and to like always like for me it's like no one has to ask for forgiveness from me no one does i just love and it's like i can't it's almost impossible for me to i lie like not to hurt someone's feelings but even then i'm like oh i wish i could tell them like it'll drive me nuts like i have to bite my tongue but that's i real and i hated that about myself i hated like how nice I was and then I realized that was just me I was designed to be loving and nice in actuality that's how humans are supposed to be that that niceness that pureness that loving and that caring that openness that's how we're supposed to be but now like how society is we almost had to learn how to defend and like overly love ourselves to not allow people to do that to us Um, let me see. Yeah, and like this family just alcoholism, gambling, cheating. Then just a lot of abuse. Like I even remember when I was little, I don't know, I tell all these horrible stories. Like my dad always loved beating the crap out of my mom, me and my brother, and it wasn't just like spankings. Um, like one time my dad, it was when I was little, we were living on um, Fort Bliss and my mom's tiny. And my dad would like beat her, pull out her hair, break her teeth. And then she, w she wasn't allowed to tell anybody. And she was afraid, you know, she wanted to protect me and my brother. Well, he had like, pushed her and shoved her and she hit the curtains and they fell and they were really tall and as his own personal entertainment and I had to watch this his own personal entertainment he tied a, a rope around her waist and she had to use a ladder to try to put to put up the curtains and whenever he felt like it he would pull the rope and knock her off the ladder and when I was younger um, I was really really afraid of the dark afraid of like even dolls that the eyes that would open it would scare the shit out of me and like I was afraid of everything and my dad was so sick and tired of it and I was a little kid of course like three four years old he made me sit in the dark by myself in the living room 
to watch The Exorcist because I was so afraid of that movie. And after that, I don't know what it was, like something snapped inside me and I think it was my guides. Like I guess it was a protection mechanism. They taught me whatever I feared, learn everything about it. Know your enemy, then you don't fear. So from that moment on, like I was this weird kid that wanted to know about UFOs, even Satanism, read about Satanism, read a researched uh, paganism, witchcraft, um, all different forms of spirituality. Like I was that weird kid. And it was even a couple of times in elementary school, they would have meetings with my parents because of the books I would get out of the library. Like it would unnerve, unnerve them. But that's what my guides taught me. Like anything you're afraid of, learn about it. And then once you know, then you're not afraid of it anymore. So even as a little kid, I was absorbing and learning tons of information. And um, yeah, and um, so and, and af my dad had went, since he was in the military, and he went to Germany. He decided to not take the family, and now I know why. Um, he ended up doing a lot of drugs over there, and he was a womanizer. He cheated a lot. And what ended up happening, like, throughout my life, like, my mom and dad were so dysfunctional. Like, they used all the money, like, for pawn shops, because um, they were always competing to try to outdo each other, like, buying jewelry and act like they didn't care about each other. And my dad was always cheating. My mom was always busy following him around. And then of course she would catch him and he would beat her and blame her for following him, like mind fuck shit, watching that. And then as I grew up, like I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to have kids. Cause I was like, if that's what happens, I was like, if I had kids, it would be, I would be, you know, inseminated. Like I was thinking shit like that. Like I didn't want to be in a relationship seeing that. And then, um, well, my dad went to Germany and he was drugging. And so he couldn't send us a lot of money. And my mom was working at a bar as a bartender. And um, she had, she wouldn't have money for babysitters. Like she would have to sell everything, pawn everything. Um, and so she would have to have boyfriends to babysit. And one of them actually ended up molesting me. But I'm not mad at him. I can remember the whole thing, which was kind of creepy weird, but I'm not mad at him. Like hurt people hurt people and so I don't accept it as anything other than that to be angry about so like I just I feel sorry for people I don't feel sorry for myself I feel pain for other people um let me see and then um I guess I'll go back to my dad, which is important. Well, when my dad came back from Germany, like he was pissed off. And even like my dad would always be drunk and tell me things, tell me and my brother things. Like he got, he lucked out during the Vietnam War. He got an office job. So he wasn't like traumatized from war events, didn't have PTSD from it, but he would get drunk all the time and then tell me and my brother that he wished he would have never met my mom, that he wished like he was in the battle during the Vietnam War, um, that basically he hated me and my brother and my mom, and he would say that all the time to me, especially me. Like a lot of his hate was like targeted towards me, which really messed me up for a long time. And I didn't find out, like I thought he hated my guts. Like he was really mean to me, like I wasn't, I, every time my brother got in trouble, I got punished for it. Like, I got beat. Um, like, I got, I was responsible for everything. As a kid, I was always cooking, cleaning, taking care of my brother, and while my mom and dad worked, like, I was like the family slave, the maid, and then I had to look pretty and be smart. But um, it wasn't until after he died, my mom had uh, told me that, uh, 
when we first came to the United States, we uh, instead of coming to where we live currently, it was a military base, a huge military base, we ended up going to Chicago where my grandma was at, it, well, his mother. Um, that my grandma and my dad were both abusive to my mom, were like, would beat her. And then um, my grandma would like starve my mom. And of course my mom couldn't tell anybody because she only speak Korean. Well, I came to my mom, I'm like two or three years old. I came to my mom, my first language was Korean, which I don't know now because my dad beat that out of me. Like I was forbidden to speak Korean and I, now I have like a mental block from learning a second language when I can learn all kinds of shit, but I can't speak a second language. Um, but um, I came up to my mom imitating my mom, my uh, dad and my grandma making out and taking off their clothes and basically having sex. My mom approached my dad and like beat the shit out of her and my grandma even beat the shit out of her and then my mom took off with me and my brother but of course um, they got us back because my mom didn't know any English. So um, while we're, we're in Chicago, they were really abusive to my mom and like starved her and everything. And then when we came to where we're at now, um, my grandma would still come and visit and my mom would get upset. And my dad threatened my mom telling her like if she told anybody about like all the stuff that was going on that all my dad had to do, because the area we lived in, for a while, they had found a whole bunch of dead bodies in the desert, um, especially where the neighborhood we were at, because it was more like the suburb area, um, that apparently uh, they thought at the time was a serial killer that was killing women, Hispanic women, and putting them in the desert. But it turned out what it was was the cartels. And then like the, the factories and the human trafficking, like the, women's, the women that were no longer useful, they would kill them and then bury them out in the area where we were living. And he had told my mom like, you know, all he had to do was shoot her in the head and put her out in the desert and no one would know anything better of it. So she just shut her mouth and like this continued on for a while. And then um, I guess when I was a little bit older, like, probably like seven or eight, I think it was, or six. My grandma stopped visiting and my dad, like I guess he started, it started really getting to him psychologically what had happened to him. So he became very depressed and I guess that was part of the reason why he did all those drugs. Like he was trying to block it all out and out of the guilt and then looking at having a daughter of the opposite sex, like it bugged him and especially when I after puberty like he treated me really bad um, and abusive and unfair rules and everything and like when he did beat us like I got beat for everything my brother did and I was a good kid I was always getting in trouble for him but like stuff like example of this um, well I did get pregnant when I was 15 because I wanted to leave home because I was tired of the abuse and being treated that way. Uh, but, um, and I was pregnant, my dad didn't know. And it was something my brother did, I got in trouble for. And what he would do is he would make us stand like, say like six inches from the wall. He would make us stand and have our arms up, stand for hours. And what he would do is like, he would punch you in the face or slap you real hard in the head, which would make the back of your head hit the wall. So it was a double hit. Like he would do shit like that. He beat you like you were a man. And the last time he did that when I was pregnant, I didn't cry. I was done with him beating me. And that scared the shit out of him that I didn't cry. That he never ever fucking put his hands on me ever again. Um, but after I learned about after he died, I was so pissed. I was so fucking pissed that no one ever told me about it and that I thought he hated me. But then like, I stopped hating him after that. Because imagine if you went through all that, what type of person you would be. And it turned out I didn't know um, his siblings had different dads it just hit him and his one of his younger brothers had the same dad 
and it turned out their dad was a pimp and I would assume his mom was a prostitute and so his siblings all had like different dads and so some of them like the mom couldn't take care of all of them so they were like sent with like an aunt or a grandma in the country or something and so I thought about it I was like I could see why how my dad was why he was so dysfunctional in the way he treated me so I hurt for him so much and I'm not mad at him I'm not even mad at his mom like she had to went through so much stuff for her to do what she did and then and then the person that did it to her and the person before that and the person before that and so it just became this huge family curse and these people doing horrible things to other people so I can't be mad at them I'm just deciding to not let it continue and that's what I'm doing now and that's what you guys should all should be doing and not being angry not hating but not allowing it and forgiving for yourself not for them for you to release yourself from the chains um there is so much oh my god I guess I'll discuss it and I'll decide when I'll just cut this I'll just stop it now. It's a lot. I'm gonna it's already been forty six minutes. And then I'll continue it on the second part. <sighs>